In this week's video, we're going to consider how to examine an IP routing table on a Cisco router. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace. Welcome back to the channel. And specifically in this video, we're going to take a look at the output of the show IP route command. That's going to give us IP version 4 route information, and we'll discuss how to interpret that output to determine things such as the source of routing information. Is a route in the routing table because it's directly connected to us? Did we statically add it? Was it learned via a dynamic routing protocol? And if so, which one? We'll also take a look at how authoritative that route information is. In other words, the believability of that route information as measured by the AD, the administrative distance. We'll discuss a concept called the longest match rule that can help us select a route if we have more than one route that could get us to a destination. And we'll define what's meant by the gateway of last resort. And if you enjoy this video, I invite you to take a look at our Udemy courses available at kwtrain.com slash Udemy, where you can select from any of the courses you see on screen for just $12.99. That's right, complete training courses for $12.99 each. But that's only if you use this URL of kwtrain.com slash Udemy. Again, that's kwtrain.com slash Udemy. Now let's get into our discussion of routing table examination. In this video, we want to consider how we can examine the routing table on a Cisco router. And we're using the topology that you see on screen, and we're sitting on router R3. And notice that router R3 is connected to a few networks, and it's also participating in an OSPF routing process and an EIGRP routing process. Also notice that R3 connects out to the internet. And instead of learning the full internet routing table, we're making the observation that there's only one way out to the internet. So if a network is not known locally, it must be on the internet, is our conclusion. So what I've done is configured a default static route that says, if I don't know of a more specific way to get to a destination network, go to the internet. Go to my ISP's router. That's my next hop. Let's take a look at this routing table. And the way we see a routing table is to say, show IP route. And first, notice this route to the all zeros network. That is the default route. The S says that this is statically configured. We did not dynamically learn this from a routing protocol. I statically configured that. And the asterisk next to that, the star, that says that this is a candidate default route. If I don't know of a more specific way to get to a network, go to this default route. And the next hop to go to any of those unknown networks using this default route, that's going to be 192.0.2.1. That's the IP address of our ISP's router. But again, if I did have a more specific route to a destination, we would not use this default route, even though the default route encompasses all possible IP addresses. This is due to something called the longest match rule. The longest match rule says, if I have more than one route entry that can get me to an IP address, I'm going to go with the route entry that is most specific meaning the route entry that matches the fewest number of IP addresses. And in the topology, notice that I've taken the class A network of 10.0.0.0, and I have subdivided it into a couple of other networks. The 10.1.1.0/24 network and the loopback zero interface on R1, that's part of the 10.2.2.0/24 network. And we see that this classful 10 network has been subnetted and we see that 10.1.1.0/24 that is directly connected to me. We're connected via gigabit ethernet 0/1. And the IP address assigned to gig ethernet 0/1 is 10.1.1.2 here on R3 and you'll see that that shows up with a 32-bit subnet mask. That's a single IP address and the L means that that is locally connected to me, connected to R3. If I see a network showing up with a code of D, that tells me that this was learned via EIGRP. Now, why does D indicate EIGRP? Well, the algorithm that EIGRP uses to determine how to get to a destination network is called DUAL, D-U-A-L, the Diffusing Update Algorithm, and that's where the D comes from. And we're going to get to that loopback interfaces network on R1 via 10.1.1.1. That's our next hop. That's the ingress interface on R1. And we're going to leave on our router out of gig ethernet 0 slash 1. And you see that I've got another connected route. I've got another local IP address. But I want you to notice the O. 
The O means I've learned this via OSPF. I've learned how to get to 172.16.2.1, which is the loopback IP address on R2. I've learned that via OSPF. To get there, I'm going to go to a next hop of 172.16.1.1. That's R2. And I'm going to leave on my gig ethernet 0 slash 0 interface. Let's scroll down a bit more, and we can see that I am directly connected to this network that goes out to the internet. And the IP address on my router that goes out to the internet has a local IP address of 192.0.2.2. So in this routing table, we're able to identify any statically configured routes. That's indicated with the S code. We're able to see a default route. That's indicated with the star or the asterisk. We're able to see connected networks. Indicated with a C code, we can see local IP addresses on this router with the L code. And routes that we've learned via EIGRP, they show up with a D code, D for dual. And routes learned with OSPF, they show up with the O code. Now, let's take a look at the administrative distance information we can get from this table. Notice that the statically configured route has the default administrative distance for a static route, which is 1. And static routes have a metric of 0. Let's take a look at that EIGRP route. It has an administrative distance of a 90. And using a fairly complicated EIGRP metric calculation, we come up with a metric that might seem large, but it's really not. It's 130,816. And EIGRP, with its administrative distance of 90, that's more believable than OSPF with its administrative distance of 110. And here we see that OSPF has a cost of 2. And that's a look at how we can view and interpret our IP routing table.